Well, let's get things started then. Everyone else, feel free to come in as you want. There's still space. So this next panel, uh, we're doing a nice little chat. It's about building a business network and beyond. This is something I'm personally really interested in. I can't wait to see what you ladies have to say. Um, we have Heidi Roizen, venture partner at Draper, Fisher, and Jurvetson. And interviewing her is Lisa Stone, co-founder and CEO of Blog Her. So without further ado, please, warm round of applause. Let's get things going for Thank this you. afternoon. Thank you, Amanda. You're welcome. Uh, I just want to, and I know Heidi joins me in this, congratulate Witty for this fantastic conference. You have a couple of tonight's honorees sitting here in the front, and I am so impressed with the speaking lineup that you all have. So congratulations to Carol and the whole organization. My name is Lisa Stone, and as Amanda mentioned, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Blog Her. Um, I think that it's important for me to note that my company might not have even gotten our first round of funding if Heidi Roizen weren't such a fantastic networker. I will tell that story at the end of this interview. But it is an absolute pleasure to be here with Heidi, who is a Silicon Valley legend as well as a Harvard Business School case. After her Stanford degrees, she founded a company, she sold a company, she went on to be head of worldwide developer relations for Apple, then she went straight into venture capital where she's been coaching and teaching back at Stanford Entrepreneurs ever since. Um, Heidi, will you start off by telling us about the network relationship, the networking relationship that you started with someone many of us know of, if not know personally, that really is a hallmark of how important it is for women and men to work together in the Valley? The networking relationship I started off with... Howard. Oh, Howard, yeah. Oh, that person, yeah. The, my alter ego, yeah. How many of you have read Sheryl Sandberg's book? So, okay, so a number of you have read the book and you know the story. So in brief, there's a very interesting study that was done many years ago with this Harvard case that was written about me. There was a Columbia professor who taught two sections of the business school, uh, the case, only he changed the name in one of the cases to Howard Roizen. And everything was the same other than the fact that one was about Heidi Roizen, one was about Howard Roizen. And he asked the students afterwards to take a quiz about how they felt about this person. And Howard scored better. Howard and Heidi scored equally competent, but Howard scored more likable. And I have to say, when that, uh, when that study was first done, it was about, uh, I think, about 12 years ago now, I was shocked because I don't even think about the idea that people would bias against me because I'm a woman. And um, so it's been interesting. When it first happened, I had to really think about it. And I thought, now, why would that be the case? Why would people think Howard is so much more likable than Heidi? And the only thing I can think of is, since the case is written about me, and he's a guy, maybe when you put a guy's name on it, he sounds like he's like really in touch with his feminine side or something, so he's like <laughs> super likable. I don't know. Um, but it just it is an interesting thing, and it is very subtle, and, and because of all the attention around Cheryl's book, um, CNN actually re-ran the test uh, recently. And the good news is Heidi scored a little better, but Howard was more, more trusted than Heidi, which is another interesting thing. So, so you never know with these things, and I think these tests are all very subjective, but it certainly it's, it's rather interesting to be the subject of a case like this because it really makes you think about, you know, am I being, is there gender bias against me? And, and I don't know if, I'm, if I have a very Pollyanna-ish view. Uh, I certainly believe in my career there have been times that uh, because I was a woman, things work differently for me. But I think sometimes it breaks in your favor and sometimes it breaks against you. And I think the beautiful thing about being an entrepreneur, sorry, I'm going to riff on this for a second, but then I'll stop. Then I'll stop, and you get to talk again. Um, <laughs> the, the great thing about about being an entrepreneur is is if a door closes, you just go open another one. I think when you work in a corporate environment, sometimes the challenge is that you're you're a little bit stuck with the people that are around you and directly above you, and and sometimes even those beneath you in the org chart. You know, you you kind of have to make do with where you are. Where with an, when you're an entrepreneur. Um, at least in terms of the external world, you can change the environment all the time. So you keep going and looking for something else. The other thing that has, that again, has been blowback from Cheryl's book, and I don't know if you, if you all have been following this, but there's been, there have been some articles written about how women don't actually help other women. Has anyone seen those articles? I'm just interested in how many of you have been following that, right? So there was an article, I don't remember which publication, but a big publication, it was a kind of a first-hand account of, well, women actually don't help women very much at all. 
And I mean, I think this is, I mean, this is crazy, but it got me thinking about it. And I thought, well, one of the reasons that I think we think differently about it here in Silicon Valley, and there's a book out right now called Stiletto Network that actually talks about the difference between sort of East Coast and mm -hmm. West Coast mentality mm -hmm. is, if you are put in a situation where only one person can win, you have no incentive to help other people, right? So, mm -hmm. so, for, so for example, take management consulting or take investment banking where they recruit a bunch of students and there's 10 students in a bullpen and they say two of you are going to make it and the other 10 are not, right? Or they recruit 12 students. My math isn't very good today. Um, and so what incentive would any of those people have to help anybody else? Because if I help you and you do a better job, I lose. The beauty of entrepreneurship and of the entrepreneurial ecosystem is when you get recruited into a startup, unless everyone has to win in order for you to win, there's no way for other people in a startup to be unsuccessful and for you to be successful. So I think that it, it is a different kind of, of environment that really encourages people to be helpful towards each other. And so one of the things I suggest to my young, um, you know, my, my Stanford students is that they find environments where the entrepreneurial spirit applies and where the whole group is only successful. If, if each individual is successful and the group is successful, that's important. It's not about the assessment of the in individual, it's also about the importance of the group because I think you end up with more collaborative environments. Not what you asked me, but you got that answer anyway. <laughs> no, but I think that's incredibly relevant. So what you're saying is instead of there being one piece of pie and we should all savage each other for it, that here in the valley, it's about creating your own pie, right? And, and making and the pie bigger and as big as possible, maximizing the value. Absolutely, right? absolutely. You know, and this is another. And, and you know, I know we, we are the, the panel is, um, is is about building a business network. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, building a business network is really important. And um, I'm super. I'm a super believer in collecting an interesting assortment of people, fellow travelers along the road who share your vision, share your ethics, and and have a diversity of skills. Because I know fundamentally, you know, my belief is I'm going to live for a long time. Number one. Number two, uh, the government's not paying for me, right? I don't think any of us can count on that. So I'm going to work for a long time, and I'm going to have to reinvent myself many, many, many times because whatever I was doing or knowing was obsolete. And also, just my interests change, right? So I've had many different careers in my life. So that's my pitch for why I think building a business network is really, really important. But one of the ways to build a business network is, and thinking about this context of, if you're the person who is known for contributing and making the pie bigger, people are going to want to work with you. And that, to me, and, and that's the interesting thing about, if you think about, for example, negotiation. Negotiation is an opportunity to build a, a, a relationship with someone. And, and how many times do you negotiate with someone, you're, uh, are you gonna run into that person again versus not? And I would say the vast majority of times, you are gonna yeah. run into that person again. So you better not be transacting as if it's win-lose. So Heidi and I were on a, a bus with a couple of you uh, recently uh, on a trip and a couple of uh, women came up and we were just exchanging advice with each other and one, a mutual friend asked Heidi, look, you're on a couple of public boards. I want to join a public board. What is your advice about how to negotiate this? Because I'd like to be compensated for my time. It's a huge commitment. It's a, you know, a, a potentially legally entangling commitment. And you said a key thing. You said negotiation is about so much more than the financials. In yep. the relationship. Yep. And then you were off to the races and you yes. had sort of three different steps that you recommended that she take. Yep. Do you want to sort of share those? Because it was. Well, I think, and, and particularly for those of you who are thinking about public board service, you know, the vast majority of public board uh, recruiting and, and, and um, um, search is done by the other people on the board. Even in public companies, about 75% is done without the benefit of professional search. So, if you want to get on a public board, number one, best thing to do is go hang out with other people who are on public boards because those are the people who recruit people for public boards. Um, and yes, the vast majority of those people happen to be men. So um, I like to, you know, one of the ways that I that I have come up to speed in that in that um, endeavor is I join the National Association of Corporate Directors. I go to the Stanford Directors College, um, the women WCD, um, you know, various groups like that. I'm involved in in different groups again, both female oriented and just board oriented, where I go meet those people. So you know, point one is. 
is you have to go be with the other people who are going to be making those decisions. And I don't think you necessarily have to be, you know, this is one of the challenges of public um, governance is the number one criterion for being on a public board is already being on a public board. So, you know, we're not going to grow that pie any if but, that's the attitude. So you've got to kind of go break into that in the first place by going and meeting those people. And I would encourage you, for example, Stanford Director's College, you don't have to be on a public board to go to Director's College. And, you know, you'll learn a lot by going to and it. And your point was, because this mutual friend of ours has multiple children at home, she has a full-time job, your point was you must invest in your personal brand and your business by networking. Absolutely, and absolutely. And you it's must... It's a key part of your agenda. Right. And, and you know, time. we could talk for hours just on public governance and, and all of that. But what I would say is, you know, it's a, it's a, something that I've chosen to pursue. I find it really fascinating. There's no monster.com for public boards, right? They don't come yeah. up that often. You have to sort of be willing to take a years long approach. And even the process you'll find is a rather slow process. It's very um, collegial because it's a lot about chemistry. And so now having gone through the process, a number of times I've been on, I'm currently on two public boards, I think I've served on six. Um, what you have to realize is that they're looking at you from, from their perspective, they want to figure out do you have something of value for them and are you going to be a fit? So one of the things I told our, our fellow uh, friend on the bus is, you know, when you walk into these things, think of it as this is a yes until I decide it's a no. If you walk in, I say this to, the same thing to entrepreneurs who are pitching for money. If you're wishy-washy about whether you even want to do this, you know, I'm meeting a hundred of you in a week. If you're the wishy-washy one, you're not going to get funded. You have to be convinced that it's what you want to do. And it's the same thing with a public board. Don't walk in um, acting like you're not even sure you want to do it. I mean, my ad attitude is this is a yes, and I'm leaning in, and I'm super excited until the moment I decide it's not right for me. And then the first thing I'm going to do is be upfront about the fact that it's not right for me, but think about what other woman can I put forth who would be a better fit. So it's just an attitudinal thing. I do see a lot of people go into these interviews, you know, I hate to say it, but not doing their homework. You know, the great thing about public companies is there's a vast amount of data available on the net about them. And you can go read all that data and you can understand a lot about a company reading through those massive, you know, documents that are, that are filed. Go learn about that. Lean in. Go in um, thinking about it as if you were making an investment in that company, because that's what you're really doing. If you join a board, you're making an investment of your reputation, your brand, and your time. And generally speaking, most of these boards, particularly in the Valley, they pay you equity that you don't really get to trade until you're off the board five to seven years later. And so you are making an investment of your time that's going to pay off in the future. Well, what's so interesting about that is whether you are seeking a role in corporate governance, or you're an entrepreneur inside a large company, or you're someone with an idea seeking venture capital funding, the pursuit of that goal for a year is a reasonable horizon. Yes. And your point of doing that work, doing that homework, being answerable for it, leaning in, I'm sorry, I love the metaphor, yeah. constantly, until yep. you get the job, don't turn it down until you have it. Right. So the next thing she asked you about was how to impress them with what she understood were their strengths and weaknesses without scaring them to death. Right, and that's a delicate thing because how do you, you, do you want to be informed, right? You want to walk in, and I think this is true of any interview, you walk in. And you in. want your network to constantly be impressed by your smarts as well, so it kind of fits to the yeah, larger. Yeah, although, you know, I think this is, that, this is that funny thing about, you know, it's like when you're afraid of a dog, they know you're afraid. It's kind of a corollary to that, which is when you walk in trying to impress someone, you're not going to impress them. Okay. So, I mean, I just sort of feel like if you walk in and you think, I've got seven points I want to get across about how friggin' smart I am. That is just not going to work, <laughs> right? You know, my feeling is that if you walk in and, and you are, you've done your homework and you're fascinated by this company, because you ought to be. If you're applying for a board position mm. or a job and you could care less about the company, I would encourage you to look somewhere else. You've got to find something interesting enough to want to do it in the first place. But, you know, you can read the tea leaves. You can, you know, you can read, you know, for example, here's one. I don't recommend this as the first question, but, you know, with Say on Pay, you can look at the voting records of shareholders and you can see how happy they are with the, with the compensation practices of the board. And uh, one of the things you might want to you know, say, and again, I wouldn't necessarily lead with this question because it's usually a contentious question, but you can, you can read comp the compensation and the say on pay and you can, you can absolutely read what people are compensating and you can say, hey, wow, I noticed that you, know, you only got a 50% yes on say on pay 
two years ago and you really changed your practices and now you got an 80%. That must have been a really interesting process. What did you, you know, what was the initial issue and how did you go about changing that? I mean, that shows you did your homework. I think it shows you're knowledgeable about compensation, but you didn't walk in and say, well, here's what I would have done and I'm so smart and, you know, whatever. So I, I think, again, looking for, looking through the data to figure out what kind of questions to ask, I think gives someone a much better um, perception of what you would be like. You know, and this is really what it is, particularly about a board interview, but I think for interviews for many things. People are kind of trial running you to see what would you be like if you really were working there. And they're looking at, do you, do you, did you notice things? Do you ask intelligent questions? Do you hog the mic? Which I'm very bad about like, no, you're right now. But, um, but, but you're, you're saying but, that you, know, you have to be friends with the people you're going to be negotiating hard with or friendly, right? Well, you know, the other thing is, like I said, it's a yes until it's a no. You have, they have to fall in love with you before you start negotiating, right? I mean, you know, if you start right up front, you know, I'm always amazed when, when particularly in junior people interview for a job and the first thing they want, they want to know about is like, how big is their office going to be? How many weeks of vacation are they going to get? Um, you know, what kind of title, you know, lunches? And they're so worried about what's in it for them. You know, that stuff's going to come at some point in the process. You don't put it in the beginning. You don't ask for the things you really need in the beginning. You ask for the things you need in the end when the person is also leaning in and wants you, right? Mm -hmm. Because starting with that just makes you sound like you're a sort of a self-centered, uh, it's all about you, which you know, we don't really want. No company like wants to know that. Questions from you guys. We have two volunteers who are mic wrangling. Can you all raise your hands? Who's one in the green? And one woman in the blue. Thank you. I'm sorry I don't know your names, but you get kudos for doing this. Questions? Questions for Heidi? I think that um, I typically hate dating and marriage analogies for yes. business. Yes. And so I'm not going <laughs> to go there, but yeah. you are talking about being able to just relax into the conversation and being able to have. Um, a smart, informed, tough conversation right. about the business metrics, but still be that person that they actually want to have lunch with. And I think this is also part of the attitude. And again, it's interesting how much corporate governance and, and being an entrepreneur, you know, these, these align in another important way. I tell entrepreneurs, if you're going to go out and raise venture, you are going to take 50 meetings before you get a term sheet. Oh, yeah. At least 50. So if you get insulted by the time you've had the 10th meeting and if you get deflated because the 10th person has yet another piece of irrelevant advice for you that doesn't sound anything like the other nine pieces of advice you got and tells you to go away, if that's going to disappoint you, then don't be an entrepreneur because get ready to take 50 meetings. And my feeling about it is if, let's say you get asked to join a public or you get asked to interview for a public board, if you go into that and you believe that if you didn't get that, if you don't get that board, there's something wrong with you, don't do it. Because you know, you'll interview for a lot of boards you won't get because so much of this is, you know, boards are teams and very often they'll be looking for a particular attribute, right? They'll be looking for someone who can sit on a um, audit committee or chair an audit committee. They'll lo be looking for someone with technology experience. They'll be mm -hmm. looking for someone with age diversity, gender diversity, geographic diversity, stuff like that, that you may just not qualify and you get invited in to, to interview and you're just the wrong, you know, peg for the hole this time around. If that's going to bother you, then, then, you know, you're going to feel really bad about things you shouldn't feel really bad about. So I think you have to always go in with the attitude of, I'm here to learn. I'm here to have an interesting conversation. I'm here to make a new friend. And if it doesn't work out this time, it'll work out another time. I see a question there. We have a question. And then I'm going to ask a, a non-simplistic question about networking, networking in the age of social media. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for coming and, and giving us your ideas and sharing your visions. I'd really like to get some clarity. You said it's a year-long process. So would you describe, if you were just going to get started, you've mm -hmm. identified a company you'd really like to work with, you're going to get started on that year-long process. Could you walk us through kind of what you're doing, even month to month? Right, as right, sure, sure. Well, you. you know, a couple of real basic things is, first of all, you know, make sure your LinkedIn profile is really well put together. Um, I have my own, I, have, I own HeidiRoisin.com. I make sure that that's really well put together, that that's populated with links and things like that. I want to make it so easy for someone to do research on me because, 
If you, Google, if you Google yourself and you're not controlling what comes up, you need to think about how you can control that. Um, and, and it's not all controllable, but doing the best job that you can of that. I think understanding the, the framework of where that company operates and who, that, who knows who in, that, in these realms and do you have a friend of a friend. And, and you know, boards are very weird because if, even if you know there's an opening, Raising your hand and saying, I'd like to be on your board is sort of, it's a, it's a little bit like asking someone on a date versus telling someone I'd be interested if that person asked me on a date. Ooh, I'm kind of creeped out that I just said that. But it is kind of true that, that it's a weird board dynamic that, that it, it's better to have someone else recommend you than to have you recommend yourself. And so it does take some networking and all of that. I think that, um, Spending time with the product, spending time understanding the company, doing a Google News alert on the name of the company so you just see the company, putting them in your stock ticker follower stuff so you know, every, you know kind of what's going on with the company. Being conversant in the company and in their competitive dynamic is really important. And then just it's getting to know people. At the end of the day, boards, board, getting put on a board is a collaborative chemistry-based decision, right? It starts with having the, you know, sort of the qualifications, but then it's all about the meetings. And, you know, my own opinion in most boards is the CEO drives it. In, in every board I've ever interviewed for, the CEO is, is the, is, it's the CEO's opinion that's going to carry the most weight. And so, you know, if possible, you know, the, one of the first interviews you should have should be with the CEO. It's hard, it's not always easy to, or, to manage that, but I think, you know, and again, frankly, most boards work that way, right? There's a nominating committee and we say, oh, we think this person would be great. Usually one of us knows that person or has met that person through another source. So you have one meeting with someone who's, who's on the board and then usually the very next meeting is with the CEO. So if you were to expand that to entrepreneurship within a company, or someone who wants to meet uh, with startups or get into a startup in a given field. How do you like to be networked with via social media? How do you like to be contacted? Or how do you recommend people who want to join startups or companies network across LinkedIn or Facebook right. or well, Twitter? I, or you know what? I'm a huge believer in, in, in using LinkedIn in understanding Facebook. I don't necessarily think Facebook is the platform for this, but mm -hmm. you can sure find out a lot about people on, on Facebook, and you should be aware of that in the, on the flip side. Um, I think that making contacts, connecting with people, I think email is a perfectly appropriate way to, to introduce yourself to someone. I still think that nothing takes the place of, of live um, meetings, and I congratulate you all on being here because this is one of the things you can do, right? I, I, I um, tell this joke when I talk about networking, and it's about this guy wanting to win the lottery, and the punchline is, work with me, buddy, buy a ticket. And the answer is, you know, you got to buy tickets in order to put yourself in a place where an opportunity will happen. And I think face-to-face -face meetings are one of the best ways to do, do that. I know in my career, I did a lot with trade associations. I worked with the Software Publishers Association for many, many years. I was on the board of the National Venture Capital Association. And those are places where, particularly if you're in a smaller company, actually it's interesting, I'd say a smaller company, but sometimes if you're in a company that's so big, I think one thing's about being in a really big company, and I've only had one year of experience being in a really big company, but what I learned is so much of your time when you're in a big company is spent focused inward. And, and you actually need to sort of get out more too. It's good for your company and it's good for you. So I think trade associations and industry groups like this are a really great way to, to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think there's nothing wrong with using, I mean, and, and you know, people who, who, who contact me on LinkedIn and you know, send me their resume or want something. I mean, I always look at those. I always will, will look at them and forward or sometimes it's not appropriate and I can't, but I, you know, I'll give it a shot. And I think most of us wanna help if we can. Can I get, there's, here's a question, please. The mic is coming right here. Thank you. Heidi, I know that you have uh, talked about being in places where you can meet with others, but I remember earlier in your career when you first thought you wanted to be on public company boards, you thought about strategically yes. how to reach out to a number of people. And I think a lot of us sit in a reactive mode at times in our career waiting to be asked. Yes. And I remember you sent out yes. a huge number of 
emails. And, yes, thank you for, for saying that. <laughs> and it because made that's me feel really... much better because you were very proactive instead of waiting, and it was a wake-up call for me. You don't wait for something to come into your inbox. Right. So right. if you could recount so this, that story. So this is, I'll start this by saying this is one of my very fa most favorite um, expressions in the world. It's called the 20-40-60 rule. Has anybody heard the 20-40-60 rule? A couple people have. So the 20-40-60 rule is this. At 20, you're constantly worrying about what other people think of you. At 40, you wake up one day and you go, I don't give a damn what other people think of me. And at 60, you come to realize no one's thinking of you. Um, and so I say this because, because Lori brings up an ex excellent point. No one is waking up every morning going, I wonder if Heidi Royzen is getting the right job opportunities. I wonder if she's fulfilled. I wonder if she's making enough money, right? <laughs> Nobody is thinking about that for me. They're not thinking about for you. They're not, you know, I, I tell this to young people. I go, even your parents kind of are absorbed with other stuff most of the time. So, so, the, so the bad news is nobody's thinking about you. The good news is also nobody's thinking about you, which means you are much more resilient than whatever the dumb thing you said yesterday, right? And, and so, I mean, people are always worrying about did they say something wrong or did they miss a connection or did they wear the wrong shoes or whatever. And again, nobody's really thinking about you, so don't worry about that as much. But the flip side is homework never ends, right? And you know, you might think, oh, I'm on public boards, so obviously other people on public boards who are looking for a new public director will wake up and think of me as soon as there's an opening. No, they're not. They're not going to think of you. They're not going to think of me. They're not going to think of anybody. So uh, when I decided I was coming off one board and I wanted to find another board, I sat down and I wrote, I spent, it took me like 10 hours. I wrote 106 emails one by one because I said, okay, who picks people for boards? People on boards, counsel to board, accounting firms that serve boards, you know, and CEOs right? Venture capitalists. And I sat down and I went and I did my homework and I went through and I picked 106 people that I thought might have a lead for me. And I looked at their bios and I figured out what boards they were on and I went and looked at the boards that they were on and I looked to see if somebody was going to come on or off. And anyway, the, the point is I did a whole bunch of homework and it actually resulted in a couple of things that it took three months for this stuff to percolate, right? Most people don't respond, some people respond, they connect you with someone else, you go have a lunch, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But in the end, I actually, it actually resulted in a couple of board opportunities that were, you know, that were close enough that I didn't end up taking, but then a few months later, someone I had contacted through that process ended up with one that I did take. And the two public boards I'm on right now, both of them, um, both of them came as a result of my going to an industry event sitting next to someone who I already knew but hadn't seen for a long time and having that person say, what are you up to? And I say, I'm serving on boards. And in one case, right there, the person said, well, I'm about to come off a board and we really need a person to take my place and you would be perfect. That's how I got on the Tebow board. And the DMGT board, I sat next to someone and we had a nice chit chat and about a week later he called me and he said, I just realized, well he emailed me because nobody calls anymore. Um, he said, oh I just realized you'd be perfect for the board I'm on and we want to bring another Silicon Valley person on the board and that's how I ended up. Now, the time between that phone call and my appointment, that phone call was in February and my appointment to the board was September, right, because it takes that long to go through these processes. But the point is, neither of those would have happened had I not gone to those events and sat next to people. And in both cases, those were people who already know me. In fact, in one case, I had already served on a board with that person. So that goes to my point about nobody's thinking about you. You have to be proactive if you want to do this sort of stuff. Well, I think it's inspirational to hear that we are sitting next to someone who is pretty much a household name in Silicon Valley, and you're still... That's scary. <laughs> but you're, it's true, and you're still thinking about strategizing and appropriately pursuing the most exciting opportunities. You have to. I mean, you absolutely have to. That's actually... Um, something that I think we can all take as a, an important tip, although I'm going to disagree with you on one thing. Yes. Um, which is that the 20, 40, 60 rule may apply in many environments, but it really increasingly does not apply uh, in Silicon Valley, and particularly to women in Silicon Valley. We got funded because mm -hmm. your friend Ann Winblad mentioned us to you, and you all mentioned us to David Simonoff, who right. had our first funding. Right. Cheryl Sandberg is holding lean-in organizations yep. you know, around the nation. Yep. Lori Oler, who's going to be up here on the next panel, holds networking groups all the time. Look at what Witty has done for all of us. So increasingly, we have an opportunity to participate with each other and to help each other. 
we always find at blogger conferences, and I certainly have at Witty, that the smartest people and most important people you meet are often at the table. Right. Right there. And I you. agree with you. Right. My point is, my point with the 2460 rule is don't expect people to think about you, but I mm -hmm. think one of the most important things all of us in this room can do, and you've just mentioned many great examples, and obviously yourself included, is spend a little time thinking about the other yeah. people and paying Absolutely. it forward because the other people are going to think about you as well. Absolutely. And that's, you know, and I think about that with, for example, with, with public boards, right? A lot of times they will call me because I'm a woman and the, and the spec is a woman, right? Because that's, I mean, on the one hand, you kind of want to run board screaming members, so. anytime somebody says, well, we want you because you're a woman. Or the worst one is, well, we had a woman once, but it didn't work out. Like, oh, okay, we tried that. Didn't work. <laughs> but anyway, one of the reasons I will always take that call, I will always take the call, I will always spend a half an hour on the phone, even though, quite frankly, I'm on six boards right now, the chance that I'm going to take on a new board is, is almost zero. I will say almost zero because if like the perfect dream board called up and said, we want you, I might consider you know, cycling off one over time and, and taking that. But the, I'm highly unlikely to take a board seat, but I will always take the phone call because I want to find the next woman to take that board seat. I don't right. want it to, if I just say no, they're gonna go to their normal network, right? They're not gonna expand the network. And I know other people who do that, you know, who did that for me, right? Who have referred me to other boards as well. So I yeah. think it's super critical to do that. Good. We have time for one more question and then we're gonna wrap. And you have been waiting patiently. Thank you very much. Heidi, this is Karen. Um, how do boards look for fit? I mean, you've been on several of them, so what are they looking for when they look for fit? And is it different for different boards? Well, there really is, there really are the two things. One thing is literally boards will put a matrix together and they'll say, what are the skills we already have on the board and what are the skills we need? You need to cover bases. You need someone who can chair compensation. You need someone who can chair audit. You need, um, you need usually you want a mix of people who, who have some operating background, you know, you, all, you almost always want at least one other former and cur or current sitting CEO. Um, you usually want somebody from the customer perspective. You want someone from the supplier's perspective. So again, there are matrices and, and some boards are willing to actually share that with you. Some of them, they kind of hold it close to the vest because it helps direct their thinking. But the second part and the even more important part is the chemistry, the fit of that person. You want someone who, who is willing to ask hard questions but not willing to sort of domineer and dominate the board meeting. You don't want single issue people. You really want people who come in and, and you also want people who, and it's kind of a funny thing to say, I mean, I, you, could, you could argue, I do this as a profession, but you never want someone who is dependent on the board fees in such a way that means that they're not going to call a spade a spade or you know, whatever it is, you know, call it as they see it and, and say, I got a problem with this. So it's a very delicate thing and so much of it does have to do with chemistry. And you know, the flip side is I have been on um, two boards where after I got there I said, I'm the wrong person for this board. You know, and, and, and in one case it was, it was actually knowledge and I didn't want to learn what I would have needed to learn to be effective on that board. In the other case it was really about chemistry. It was really about chemistry. And I decided in both those cases not to seek re-election. I didn't abandon the board because that puts the company in a bad, you know, it's bad to step off a public board, but I just chose not to get re-elected because I said, this, I'm the wrong person for this board. See, it's, sometimes you just don't know till you get there. Just like a job. So yeah. personal integrity, rock solid preparation, both yourself and on the job, a willingness to network really and realistically on behalf of what you're trying to accomplish and on behalf of your employer slash your investor. And then finally, a willingness to walk if something isn't a fit. Um, do it for yourself. And do it if for you the feel company. that your integrity is being compromised, that would be one case where I would say don't wait for the end of your term. Get out. Right on. Absolutely. So with that, I think we need to wrap up because we have another fantastic panel coming forward. Thank you, Heidi Royce. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Lisa Stone. Later.